uh, we're going to just briefly touch on uh, aeronautical decision making here. So that's, and we're going to continue talking about that throughout all of our ground school lessons, throughout all of our flights. Aeronautical decision making is basically just the FAA's fancy way of saying, don't do anything stupid. And be careful. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but to that end, we have some processes we go through we, to, make, to help us make good decisions to uh, take all the information that we have at our disposal, uh, process that, and uh, come up with a good course of action. Um, as we progress through the flights, that will of course be just included in all of our flying, but behind the scenes in my head and hopefully eventually in your head, um, there will be these processes going on of taking in all of the uh, information that we are seeing outside the airplane, from the instruments inside the airplane, from what we feel, from what we hear, and making good decisions as to how to conduct so our flight. So your brain and your head is always moving. Exactly. They never sit still. Exactly. And that's that only becomes more and more true as you move deeper and deeper into flying. Um, and in fact, as you progress through, if you go beyond the private level, you'll find that increasingly more and more of flying is about processing information, making good decisions, and continuing to be able to make good decisions as we get into more and more complex situations. Well, that was always one of my fears about being a pilot is I may get rattled. And reading that decision-making chapters in the book, it's like they lay it all out just figure it out you go through these processes and, exactly. and you'll be fine you'll cut your odds down a lot so. exactly and that's all that's what it's all about ultimately is risk management um, you mean flying's risky there is an inherent level of risk <laughs> in anything we do uh, flying driving uh, true walking across the street now uh, based on statistics that I've heard and uh, my own personal experience, I would say that uh, flying is probably less risky than crossing the street, uh, particularly out on a busy road like we have out in front here. <laughs> yeah. But it's a uh, crazy out there this time of day. Uh, because any accident or safety issue in flying uh, is so widely reported on, so much in the public eye, uh, we as pilots and the FAA both work very hard to improve safety all the time. Yeah, the media um, loves to blow it up. Exactly. So, you know, the, aviation is one of the safest activities that we do uh, in modern life, and that's mostly because of how we've narrowed in on all of those risk factors and controlled them to the best of That's why can. becoming a pilot's not easy. There's a lot of study and a lot of work just to fly a simple plane. Right. So the a lot of the physical skills of actually flying the airplane, much like driving a car, is stuff that you just learn by doing. But the reason that we have ground school is to go through all of the thought processes, all the things that we need to consider, take into account. It's much more complicated than sitting about. behind the wheel of a car. Uh, to a certain extent, it is. And as you move further and further into flying, that becomes more and more true. Yeah. So, when the FAA talks about aeronautical decision making, um, they have a, a lot of acronyms, a lot of... I've learned that. Mnemonics, you know, ways of trying to remember how we make good decisions. So, um, Obviously, we've talked about ADM, aeronautical decision making. Uh, another acronym that uh, comes up in this chapter, which comes up increasingly as you move more into professional flying, is CRM, Crew Resource Management. Um, and the analog of that for recreational flying, single pilot flying, SRM, Single Pilot Resource Management, as the FAA likes to call it nowadays. Um, so they have uh, a number of mnemonics, PAVE, which P-A-V-E, which uh, stands for Pilot, Aircraft, Environment, with the V being <laughs> what they're using, and E for external pressures. Um, they also have 
uh, something that I was actually talking about a moment ago. Uh, they call it the 3P model, perceive, process, perform. So that's what I was talking about when we take in all of that information that we see with our eyes, that we hear, that we feel through the structure of the airplane. Um, that's perce uh, perception. So we perceive what's going on. Process, we take all of that information, we uh, think about what's happening, we try to understand what's happening, look ahead, sort of predict what will be happening within the next few seconds or minute or whatever it takes to make the decision that's in front of us. And then we come up with a course of action, we perform that course of action. So this is, it may sound like pretty basic stuff when you talk about it, but when you get in the airplane, it really helps to have that foundation of, okay, I'm going to look at what I have, I'm going to figure out what I need to do, and then I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, I noticed when I was reading through some of that, they have a whole bunch of different versions. They do. But is the three Ps the ones you like? Is that the one you, is that the one I should focus on because that's the one that makes it's, the most sense to you. It, it is. It seems easier to remember because it's three P's. Was it perceive, process, and perform? perform. So it, To be quite honest, a lot of this stuff becomes instinctual as we begin right, to fly. Right, but I'm and, not there yet. <laughs> and as we get into the lessons in the airplane, um, there will be individual factors that we'll talk about. So, for example, when we start practicing landings, uh, one thing you'll probably hear me say is, do you think you're high or do you think you're low? And I'm talking about the glide path here coming in right. for a landing. And you'll take a look at it and say, well, Jake, I think we're high or I think we're a little bit low, depending on what you see. And then I might come back and say, well, Philip, what are you going to do about it? and uh, that is where you uh, process what you've seen and come up with a course of action, usually either adding some power to flatten our glide a little bit or maybe putting in a little bit of a slip since we don't have any flaps on this airplane right. to create a little bit more drag. So that's sort of an example of how we perceive what's going on, process that, and turn that into a course it's, of action. There's just multiple ways of, it's, it all becomes second nature. Exactly. That's what I'm looking forward to because I think that'll help me so many other ways. Exactly. Too. It's just those three seem easier to remember than the ones that have five P's and right. a whole bunch of different words in them. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah. That. I'm going with that one. Sounds good. <laughs> so, um, the FAA talks a lot about managing risk and in fact that is really the heart of what we're doing as pilots most of the time. We are looking at what are the threats that we're dealing with. So uh, another acronym that uh, we're going to throw in the mix here is TEM, Threat and Error Management. So when we do our briefing before takeoff um, one of the things we're going to talk about is what are the threats on today's flight? And we might say, well, it's a little bit windy today, or uh, we haven't flown in three weeks, so we might be a little bit rusty, or you know, it's getting close to sunset, we might have the sun in our eyes. That uh, Anything that, that uh, makes the flight more complicated or uh, adds operation. It's good to perceive it before right. you get going so you can... Exactly. Anything that adds operational complexity, something else that we have to deal with that we don't normally have to deal with, that's a threat. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, some, depending on who you uh, talk to, some people also say that a threat also has to be beyond the pilot's control. So, the sun being in our eyes, that's beyond our control. Can't control the wind. Wind, yeah, gusty wind, that's beyond our control. So those are things that we need to just deal with mother nature has thrown them at us and we have to uh, mitigate those risks that mother nature has presented us with um, and as we go through our briefings for our flights and our debriefs after our flights um, we're going to uh, use the model of threat and error management to go through our plan for the flight and then how the flight went afterwards. 
So threat and error management has three parts. We've talked about threats. Errors are things that we do as pilots that are perhaps not the best course of action or that we could uh, find a better way of doing. And even for very experienced pilots, we don't always do everything perfectly. So when we brief our flights and when we look at reviewing our flights, we always try to look at what we've done well, what we could improve on, and carry that forward into future flights to try and do it a little bit better the next time. So we look at our threats, we look at what errors we could make or may have made, and then we look at how are we going to manage those. So if, uh, to go back to our example of setting up for a landing, well, if we're, if I ask you how do you think your approach is looking, you say, I think I'm looking a little bit low. Well, that's likely to have been an error from maybe having flown a little bit too far from the runway, now you're low. Uh, so managing that is we add some engine power, get back up on our glide path, and continue on for our landing. That's a very simple example of yep. uh, managing an error, but uh, we're going to continue to use that model to take a look at what we've done, what we've done well, what we could do better. And as we move through our flying lessons, uh, that is the heart of learning to fly, is we get up in the airplane, I show you uh, what we're working on, you give it a try, and then we look at what you did well, what you could do better, and we move forward uh, to pr either practice it some more or move on to the next activity to incorporate that into a larger concept. So as we uh, look at some of the material here, so we're, looking, we're in uh, Chapter 2 of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Uh, that has to do with uh, all of our uh, risk management, aeronautical decision making, threat and error management, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we manage our risks. We've talked about uh, um, how we, the process we go through to make decisions, and uh, also something the FAA loves to harp on, which uh, is a is a, uh, a valuable thing to realize, but of course, in the moment is hard to see, is hazardous attitudes. So I remember reading. Um, that. Yeah, they have they have uh, five of them. Uh, Anti-authority, uh, their example is don't tell me, impulsivity, do it quickly, invulnerability, it won't happen to me, macho, I can do it, or resignation, what's the use? So, the, I've, and I've seen pilots at all levels exhibit these to one extent or another, um, and part of the challenge is in the moment, if you're experiencing one of these attitudes, it can be very hard to sort of step outside yourself and say, I need to think about this differently. Right. Um, if I look at those, the one that jumps out at me, is you'll probably catch me doing it, is the do it quickly. When I panic, I go mm -hmm. into like hyper mode and I try and, my yep. brain runs and I try and plan my attack, but I try and move fast to get things done. And that's right. probably, I'm just telling you now, when we get out there, you might catch me in the middle of that one and you can right. throw that impulsivity at and me. That, and uh, that is why we have procedures and checklists that right. we follow. When we get into a stressful situation, uh, perhaps uh, an emergency like an engine failure, uh, uh, some problem with the aircraft systems, although in the chief, obviously, we don't have a lot, of systems, a lot of systems. Not a lot of systems to go wrong. But that's why we have an emergency checklist. So, for example, when we go to practice simulated engine failures, I'll 
pull the throttle out to idle and we'll be gliding and I'll have you pull out the emergency checklist and go through all of our items to uh, simulate trying to restart the engine of course it's already running so well the um, chief's gonna be hard to restart an engine you have to hand prop we're exactly kinda, that thing dies we're screwed <laughs> well, we're looking for a place to land exactly <laughs> so and that's why when we simulate an engine failure we never do it by actually turning the engine no, off not engine, in that plane. we only uh, pull the, uh, the throttle out uh, and I may not even pull it out all the way depending on what I'm simulating because actually when you pull the throttle out all the way uh, that propeller basically turns into an air brake and actually creates drag. Yeah, so, it slows you down. Uh, there's a concept called zero thrust, which is the setting where you're not, the propeller is not creating thrust, but it's not creating drag yet either. But that's in the future. So the um, when we get into a hazardous attitude, uh, sometimes it takes someone else to snap us out of it. Hopefully, by going through some of these processes that we have in uh, process of aeronautical decision making, we can help to mitigate it ourselves. But uh, it's also useful when you're learning to fly. That's part of the reason you have an instructor in the airplane is to, uh, if you get into one of these attitudes, and uh, two of the most common for student pilots would be impulsivity or resignation. And so there may come a time in a lesson where you're like, I'm just not feeling it today. What's the use of continuing? And that might be when I say, you know, here's some things you've done really well today. And, you know, you're making good progress. And, you know, I won't push you to, you know, keep flying on a day when it's just, you know, it's just not the right day, but at the same time, I probably will push you just enough to say, you know, what do you think? Yeah, it's you know, if you're if you don't think you're doing so hot, maybe you're doing better than you think you are, and you just know. too hard on yourself. Exactly. You yeah, know, I'll probably hit that wall. <laughs> so, as a flight instructor, that's uh, part of our function is to uh, help the flying student work through some of these uh, difficulties that may come up in the learning process and see what uh, what we've learned, what we've improved on that we can build on. Um, but when you become a certificated pilot and you're out flying by yourself, that's when it becomes even more critical to know about these because there may not be anyone out there to help snap you out of it if you get into one of these hazardous attitudes. So at that point, that's when you just have to fall back on your training, your experience, and say, I'm up here in this airplane. Whatever happens, I have to fly it, get it to the ground safely. And uh, that's when you the... you hurry up and slow down. Yep. Yep, just... Uh, one step at a time, as we will do throughout all of the training, one step at a time. Um, on our flights, um, obviously, as I've talked about, it's all about mitigating risk. And uh, here on page 2-7, figure 2-6, we have a very useful sort of checklist uh, to help us assess that risk. So they have different factors like maybe you didn't sleep well last night, maybe you you know, didn't sleep very much, are you, do you have a cold, are you not feeling well, is the weather not the best, um, are you feeling stressed that day, you know, is it, is it daytime, is it nighttime, um, are you under time pressures, and each of these things, um, this uh, checklist here has a score attached to it, and this uh, kind of matrix can help you to uh, determine what the level of risk on our flight is and the more risk that you find associated with a particular flight the more you maybe think uh, is this actually the day to go fly and uh, as you gain more experience there will you know there will be 
factors that will have you know, less impact when you're first learning to fly and as a newly certificated pilot you want to be very conservative when making right. these decisions. Um, you know, the give yourself plenty of you know capability and reserve for you as a pilot to say, you know, you don't you don't want to push your limits too much. But as you gain experience as a pilot, you'll gain the ability to manage risks more effectively, and uh, the level of risk that, for example, uh, let's say it's a, a gusty, windy day, as a brand new pilot. Uh, you may say 10 miles an hour of wind, that's just too much. Uh, as you gain more experience, maybe you have 100, 150 hours of time as a pilot now, well then you, maybe you'll say, you know, I can probably handle 15 miles an hour. And uh, you'll also want to look at what the airplane's limitation is. Most airplanes uh, have a maximum demonstrated crosswind, that's not a limitation, but it's just saying uh, this is the most that the manufacturer has tested it to. Most of them are in that 15 to 20 mile an hour range. That's not to say you can't fly in more wind than that, but uh, if you go in more wind than that, your level of risk starts going up. It's going to get interesting fast. Exactly. and. Uh, as a low time pilot, it's important to recognize that uh, if you haven't flown in conditions that are challenging in a particular respect before wind, you know, clouds, visibility, uh, any number of different risk factors or even personal factors like, you know, how much sleep did you get? Are you stressed? Um, All of these things contribute to what level of risk a flight has. And as an inexperienced pilot, you're going to have less ability to deal with those risks, manage those risks, and make the flight safely than you will as you gain more experience. Um, so that's part of where you come into this uh, mnemonic the, the FAA has paved. So the pilot, um, that is uh, how are you feeling? Are you up to this flight? And within that they have another one, I'm safe, which is how are you feeling as a pilot? So illness, are you sick? Medication, are you taking any medications that might impair your ability as a pilot? Stress, are you under stress from work, personal life, you know, uh, is it just not a good day? Did you get stuck in a traffic jam that, you know, made you impatient? Any number of those stressors. Uh, alcohol, obviously, uh, as pilots, uh, we're not allowed to drink within eight hours before uh, flying an airplane. Uh, for professional pilots, most of the uh, guidance is 12 hours, depending on uh, what the limitation is at a particular uh, employer, but usually it's 12. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Fatigue, uh, obviously, are you well rested? Has it been a long day? What time of day is it? Is it near a, a what they call window of circadian low? So you know how that you get that after lunch feeling around yep, two o'clock. Two o'clock in the afternoon. For me, it's two to two thirty. Doesn't yep. matter how rested I am, I hit a wall. Exactly, and that's you know may not be the best time to go flying if you're just not feeling it that day. It's you know maybe taking you know thirty minute nap in your car before you go pull the airplane out. Yep. You know, and uh, then the uh, last aspect of the I'm safe mnemonic is uh, emotion. Are you uh, are you in a fit emotional state to fly? Are you angry? You know, uh, sad? Are you stressed? You know, all of these things have to be taken into account and there are some days where you're just gonna say you know this isn't the day to go yeah. on the airplane and that's okay. Mm.
better safe than sorry. Exactly. So those are all the things that figure into are we as a pilot ready to undertake the flight? Uh, the next element is the aircraft. Um, is the uh, is the aircraft in condition to fly? Is it you know airworthy? Is it you know, you know have we've done our pre-flight inspection? Make sure it's not damaged. There's no uh, no issues with the aircraft that are going to increase those risk factors. Um, is the aircraft equipped for the flight we want to do? You know, it's getting towards dusk. Chief doesn't have lights, so that's a consideration. And you know, we have to think about we have to be back before sunset on all our flights mm -hmm. in the chief. Um, do we have enough fuel? Do we have the performance to get off the runways that we need to get off of? Um, all of these things figure into making sure that our aircraft is ready. The environment, uh, weather, are we, uh, is this a good uh, weather day to go flying? Do we have the visibility? Do we have the ceilings? Uh, when we talk about ceiling, we're talking about how high the clouds are above the, the bottom ground. Of the clouds. Bottom of the clouds. Um, is the wind too strong? All these things that figure into weather for flying and is this a good day to go. Um, then we have uh, obviously besides the weather we have you know around here we don't have much terrain but uh, if you go fly out west obviously you got mountains. mountains so that's something to consider are you familiar with the area you know if you're out west for some reason flying out there have you received uh, instruction in flying in the mountains because that's a whole other it's a whole different it's a whole other thing that you have to be familiar with uh, the airport uh, you know how long is the runway how wide is the runway is the runway wet is the runway slippery all these things that can uh, affect taking off landing taxiing on the ground uh, are there any Notices to airmen, NOTAMs, that's another acronym, by the way. That one I knew. That one I've heard <laughs> enough in my drone days from flying drones. We've talked yep. about NOTAMs a lot. Yep. So that so, one I'm aware of. So, you know, are there taxiways that are closed? Are there runways that are closed? Are there, you know, construction cranes near the airport that may not have lights on them? Things like that. Um, airspace. Uh, obviously the big one is TFRs, Temporary Flight Restrictions. And those are issued... Uh, Military in, training, yep, dignitaries uh, flying through. Right. F you know, officials, government officials often have uh, TFRs around them. They also put up TFRs around things like uh, wildfires, firefighting mm, operations, anything where either the pilot would be in danger from getting close to it, like a wildfire, or where uh, something else might be in danger from the pilot getting close, like the uh, uh, government officials. So that's something that we always want to check right. when we get our weather briefing, either through calling on the phone or through uh, most of that stuff we can do on our cell phones nowadays, but uh, one way or the other, we want to make sure that all the uh, airspace is uh, what we is uh, open for the kind of flying that we need to do. Uh, obviously, you talk about is it nighttime? Um, the chief can't fly at night, so we're probably not going to be running into this much. But uh, there are a whole other set of factors that come into play flying at night, like you need more fuel reserves. Uh, you need to make sure all the lights are working. Uh, you can get optical illusions at night. Yep, I've heard about um, those. The, when we are looking for airports or other airplanes, um, it's hard to see those at night sometimes. So we need to uh, make sure we're aware of all those uh, threats that may come up uh, associated with flying at night if we're doing that. Um, and then, so that's all falls under the category of environment for that PAVE checklist. And then finally, E, external pressures. So this is where uh, 
private pilots and uh, inexperienced pilots can get themselves into a lot of trouble. He get he's you know say you know to a friend of yours, I'm going to meet you you know in your town at two o'clock. And you feel well, like you have to get. You there. feel like you have to get there. Not only do you have to get there, do you feel like you have to be there right at two? And uh, sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I need a little more time. I need to add some more fuel. I need to check something out on the airplane. Uh, I need to check the weather again. Any number of things that take more time in preparing for the flight. And particularly as private pilots or inexperienced pilots, we need to be aware of what these pressures are and know that uh, we still have to do our due diligence in safety. Uh, preparing for the flight, remaining safe, uh, all those things. So some of the factors that are pointed out in the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge is someone waiting for us at the end, as I said. Uh, do you have a passenger uh, who really wants to go flying? You know, you say, you know, let's say this is, you know, you just got your license, this is the first time you're going to take your wife up flying in the airplane. You really want it to be a, a good day, but, uh, you know, let's say you get to the airport and, uh, I don't know, you find, you find one of the, uh, the steering chains on the tailwheel is broken. It's like, well, not happening today. Not happening today. Um, you got to have the mechanic come up and take a look at that, make sure that the airplane's all ready to fly. Um, desire to demonstrate pilot qualifications. That's the uh, showing off. Yeah. T two words. It's a hold my beer moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's never good. That's uh, two words that you uh, almost never want to utter as a pilot is watch this. <laughs> yeah. In the RC world, we say, hold my beer. Yeah. <laughs> watch this, hold my beer. It's about to get epic. Uh, another factor which comes up a lot in cross country flying is uh, get there itis, get home itis, they call it. So it's, you know, Let's say you've been out flying all day. Maybe you've gone to a fly-in breakfast. You've been out flying with some buddies, and uh, you know you got something going on at home. You got to, you know, rake the leaves or whatever at home. And it's like I just I got to get home. But let's say there's weather moving in, and no, you don't. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I'm gonna sit and wait this out for an hour or two. Make sure the conditions are good. Or sometimes. Maybe you tie the airplane down, you go over to one of your buddies and say, uh, hey, Joe, can you give me a ride home today? Yeah. You know, it's just sometimes if, uh, if the conditions are not, uh, not there for what you need to fly as a pilot of your experience level, you just need to say, I got to wait, slow down, or maybe even not go today. And uh, obviously, as we've been talking about throughout this, emotional factors play into it a lot. You know, you can really feel pressured to get a flight done just to prove that you can or that, you know, you feel like you have a lot of pride riding on, you know, I have to get this flight done today. and. Sometimes you just have to say, this isn't the day. Yep. So these are all factors that go into uh, making those decisions. Is it a good day to fly? Uh, is it a good day to keep flying? Do we have to, you know, been flying for a while already? Well, maybe it's had enough today. It's, you know, the weather's getting challenging or, you know, you're feeling tired. It's 2 o'clock. Maybe it's time to call it a day. Um, of course, we've already talked about the uh, proceed process, perceive, perform. process, and perform. We've got a whole bunch of different uh, examples of all of these ways that we can go through making decisions here, and uh, from about page 2-13 through There's a lot of good scenarios in there where they say, here's the scenario, right. here's what happened. 2-20. In, the, in this range of pages, we get a lot of uh, 
talking about, as you say, scenarios that we can do. In the think trench through. stories. Exactly, exactly. And we'll talk about those uh, as we move into actually flying. Um, we'll get uh, some more. Uh, when we get in the airplane, um, we'll have a better idea of how we can incorporate all of this into uh, it'll real, all make more sense world, when we're doing it right real world scenarios and that's uh, a big thing that uh, the FAA is into right now which I'm wholeheartedly in support of as they call it scenario based training so rather than just talking about abstract concepts we go out to the airport and we say well here's the here's the plan for the flight or here's a scenario that we want to think through you know here's how we're going to set it up here's the things we need to think about and what decision would you make based on the information that we have again perceive process perform another uh, we we're talking about when it's time to call it a day so a very good graph they have here, a figure 2-20. Throughout a flight, what is the workload on us as a pilot, and how much mental energy do we have to deal with the task that we have to accomplish? And this shows uh, during the pre-flight, it's ramping up a little bit, but of course we're on the ground, we're, you know, we're not under any time pressure, or we shouldn't be anyway. Uh, so it's just gradually ramping up. Takeoff, we have a lot of stuff going on. We have all our pre-flight checks to run through. We have taxiing out to the runway, possibly air traffic control to deal with. Um, so that uh, ramps up our workload a lot. After takeoff, we get up to cruise flight. If we're just doing cross-country flight or flying out to breakfast somewhere or something, not much going on. So the workload goes down a little bit and we get to the destination, that's when things get busy because then we have to look at the chart, make sure we're familiar with the airport we're going to, think about how we're going to get into the pattern, we're communicating with ATC, we might be doing uh, a landing cal you know, landing performance calculation based on the conditions that we've uh, gotten from the weather reports. Um, so our workload really spikes up around the approach and landing and right at that time we're also starting to get fatigued from maybe having had a long flight. And thinking about all that other stuff. Thinking about all that other stuff, thinking about what's going to happen when we get on the ground, you know, are we meeting someone, or just, you know, we want to get on the ground before they stop serving lunch. <laughs> and uh, so the our capability as a pilot starts to decline because we're... Uh, We've been focusing throughout the whole flight, and now we've got a whole bunch of other stuff on our mind. And right there where the workload goes up and our capability starts to go down, that's where we have to really be careful to take our time, make sure we do all the steps, and uh, get the airplane safely on the ground. Manage the risks, as they, uh, as they say. A um, whole bunch of stuff here on... Uh, electronic flight instrumentation, which of course not going to get a lot of in the chief, but uh, that can be great for situational awareness, uh, but it can also introduce a lot of complexity when you get into the more advanced computerized flight information systems. Uh, you almost have too much information sometimes. You have so many, you have so much information coming in that you have to perceive that processing it takes uh, long watched time. a few videos of guys doing IFR flights and yeah. flying jets and that Citation Max guys yeah. you told, showed me. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's constant chatter, constant movement. Yep. So that's a little bit about uh, aeronautical decision making. Um, we'll continue to talk about this as it comes up in the course of uh, future ground schools and in the course of our It'll flying. It'll piece of everything we do pretty exactly. much. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we want to make sure that we're always making good decisions, always keeping it safe, and uh, just making sure that we're uh, conducting the flight in the best way we can. Being aware of our threats, managing our errors, and uh, just performing 
top level we can as pilots. 